Saha Dhammika friends, Kalayana Mitas, and truth seekers who are interested in the Dhamma. Today we'll discuss the fourth stage or area of Anapanasati, which was left over from yesterday. In the first stage, we deal with the body. In the second, we deal with the feelings or vetana. Then in the third stage, we deal with the jitta, the heart or mind. And then in the fourth stage, we deal with dhamma or nature and the law of nature, as particularly as it has to do with human beings with ourselves. One aspect of nature is attached to, is clung to by us, and there arises dukkha. Another aspect of nature is the truth of nature. And this second aspect can correct or cure our problems that arise from attaching to the first aspect of nature. Both of these aspects are called nature, however, and so we will study them in order to eliminate the rest of our problems. The first lesson here is called Anicca Nupatsi, the contemplation of impermanence. This is to observe and investigate impermanence, especially of the things that we are still attached to, of the things we cling to as I and mine. We can see that the Lord Buddha took anicca, impermanence, as the starting point for our study of nature, for investigating the way things really are. All jnanas, that is, all knowledge that arises from insight, can be distinguished into all the dozens or hundreds of them can be distinguished into two categories or two aspects. The first kind of jnana is called dhammatiti jnana, which is insight into the way things naturally stand or just the way things naturally are. The second kind of jnana is called nibbana jnana, which is insight and knowledge into the breaking up of attachment, the ending of attachment which culminates in the realization of Nibbana. So there are these two aspects of jnana to investigate or to that arise from correct practice. The insight into impermanence is the starting point of all the other insight knowledges. So from insight into impermanence develops insight into dukkha, the state of unsatisfactoriness, the dukkhaness of things, which leads to insight into anatta, not self, and so on, up to the jnana, to nipita jnana knowledge of disenchantment, which is the beginning of the Nibbana jnanas. We are, so they all start off with insight into impermanence. So we'll look at impermanence or anijang in some detail now. It's true that we might, that we can see impermanence in the things around us, in the world around us. But this is to see impermanence with our eyes, with our physical eyes. But here we need to see impermanence with our heart, within the depths of the mind. <clears throat> so our technique of practicing here is to turn inward and to see impermanence in the things we experience directly within our mind rather than looking, using our eyes to see impermanence externally. This means that we see impermanence 
directly in our own experience. We, we experience impermanence inwardly. We, we feel impermanence within these inner experiences. For example, we can take the long breathing. Breathing in long, one can feel the impermanence of the long breathing. Breathing out long, one experiences the impermanence of the long breathing. We do this within the heart, within the mind, not with our eyes externally. And so we, we look at the breathing until we see its impermanence. We look at the, the longness or the length of the breathing to see its impermanence. We see how it's changing from in to out or how the length is always changing. And then we look at this fact or truth of impermanence itself until we experience it deeply. So we, we look at these things, we, we watch this impermanence. This means that we feel it, we experience it within the mind. We don't look at it with our eyes, we look at it with the mind, inwardly. This can be called looking also, but don't confuse it with visual seeing whether the long breathing itself or the effects the long breathing has on our body, on our feelings, on our experience. The, all of these are impermanent. The characteristics of the long breathing are impermanent. The short breathing in all its meanings and aspects and all the things associated with it are impermanent in just the same way. The condition that the, the breathing and the flesh body are interrelated, interdependent, interconnected, this, this condition is also impermanent. It's always changing. And then our controlling the, the body by calming the breathing, this this process is also impermanent. <clears throat> it's constantly changing. This control of the breath and the body cannot be sustained forever. It changes. So all of this is also impermanent. The cruder kinds of PT, which we can call rapture, is impermanent. The more calm, the calmer forms, such as contentment, are impermanent. All the effects that PT has on the mind are impermanent. All aspects, types, and forms of PT are impermanent. PT is, is impermanent. The fact that PT conditions the mind is something that's changing rapidly, constantly. There's, it's very unstable, very Ephemer ephemeral PT is absolutely impermanent. The, the fact that the conditioning of the mind by PT is excited, excited, it's agitating, disturbing. It disturbs the mind. It's always impermanent. All the different kinds which we mentioned yesterday, every one of them is impermanent. Delighting the mind and the delightfulness itself are impermanent. Controlling the mind, making it samadhi, is impermanent in all aspects. This mental mastery is totally impermanent. Liberating the mind from the things it's attached to is, is impermanent. This means that we go back and see impermanence in the first, second, and third stages. Seeing these various conditions or realities of the body, feelings, and mind display impermanence much more clearly, directly, and profoundly than any external study of impermanence can do. 
seeing impermanence in the sun, the moon, the stars, the changing seasons, or any of these external things, can never compare with seeing impermanence directly, inwardly, within one's own experience. Seeing impermanence leads to the realization of the fact of dukkha, the dukkhaness, the unsatisfactoriness or undesirableness of these things which are impermanent. Realizing impermanence and dukkhaness leads to realizing anatta or not-self. Realizing not-self leads to, to realizing the, the way things naturally are, the ordinariness, the naturalness, the natural way of things, which is called amatitata, amatitata. Amatitata leads to seeing tamaniyamata, which is the fact that all these natural things, all this nature, is under the control, under the power of the law of nature. The fact that everything is under the power of this natural law, that everything depends on this natural law, leads us to realizing itapajayata, the, the law of conditionality, the reality that everything depends upon causes and conditions. Seeing all of this leads to seeing sunyata, voidness, the, the fact, the reality that all of these things are void of any meaning of self. There's, there's no meaning or value or reality of self that could be attached to, clung to as I and mine. Seeing the, the void that things are void of self in every respect leads to seeing tatata, tatata, or the thusness, the, the fact that things are just like this. This is, they're just such, the suchness or thusness of things, tatata. When, when, Tathāta is realized, the mind real, um, enters the state or condition of, of being unshakable, of being still and unmovable. This is called atammayata, the mind that cannot be shaken or moved by any of these, these objects is called Atamayata. The Rocky Mountains in North America, the Alps in Europe, and the Himalayas in India, all of these still shake and tremble when, when the earth shakes, when there's an earthquake. But the mind with Atamayata, the mind that is Atamayata, is totally unshakable. It won't tremble or quiver in even the least little way. An example that's closer to us, which will help us to understand a Dhammayada, is imagine a beautiful young woman. But this woman has a Dhammayada. So then even a flock of, of handsome, rich, um, debonair, suave playboys can come by, and not one can pick her up because she's got a dhammayada, she doesn't fall for any of them. On the other side, a handsome young man who has a dhammayada, even a, a herd of beauty queens who might come by, or a lot of um, deva, beautiful female devas can come by and his head wouldn't be turned the least by any of them. This series of deep, this progression of deepening insight beginning with anicca, the, 
the reality of impermanence leading up to atamayata, this mind which is unconcoctable, unshakable, unmovable, leads to the, the breaking up, the dissolving, the fading away of attachment. This is called viraka, viraka. The one whose mind is unmovable, total, is totally, totally stable, balanced in atamayata, cannot be pulled or pushed by good and evil. There's no one can get this person to do anything bad or harmful. Any kind of selfishness is impossible for such a person because of this of being unmovable in Adamayata. The second lesson now is that when the mind is unmovable in incorrectness, when the mind has this unshakable correctness, or the there is a breaking up and dissolving of attachment to all the things that one has attached to. This dissolving of attachment to the objects of attachment, contemplating this dissolving and fading away of attachment is called virakanubhati. When something dissolves and fades away, it eventually comes to an end. This quenching of things, quenching of attachment especially, is called nirotha. Contemplating this quenching of all forms of attachment is called nirot, nirota nubhati. In the third lesson, then one, one watches, one observes and contemplates the fading away until things are quenched, the fading away until quenching of, of the defilements of upadana, attachment, of, of dukkha, of sankhara, of the concocting of mind, or of avicca, ignorance, whatever, whichever, you, however you want to call it, contemplating how things fade away and then quench. This is called nirota, nirotapatnubhatsi, the contemplating of quenching. Then the fourth lesson is a giving back, a letting go of and giving back or throwing back all the things that one attaches to. All the things that have been attached to are given back, are thrown back. This is called bhati nitsakanu a simile or comparison that is easy for any ordinary person to understand is that all along we have been taking and claiming all, everything, all kinds of things as being I and mine. We've, out of our own foolishness, we've taken things to be I and mine. This means that we, have, we are thieves. We've been stealing these things. We're con men, we're corrupt, accumulating all these things that don't really belong to us. But now, having seen the way things really are and cut the defilements, we are able to give it all back to the rightful owners. Returning all these things, throwing, tossing them back to the rightful owners, the rightful owner, is called bhati nitsaka anubhati. We can see clearly if we observe that all the datus or elements, the, the ayatana, the sense bases and sense inner and outer, and the khandas, the aggregates of existence, all of these datus, ayatanas, and khandas can seem to be just natural things. They belong to nature, not to us. But because of our, our stupidity, 
we have grasped at them, we have grabbed them and claimed them to be I and mine. And because of, due to the, because this attaching is, goes against the way of nature, we must be punished. And so we pay the penalty which is dukkha. Because I and mind, because ego arises and identifies and claims all these things, then this I, this ego, must be punished by dukkha. But once seeing the way things really are, then there's, there's no more need to be punished. One is no longer out of harmony with nature. Possessions, property, wealth, food, clothing, um, buffaloes, cattle, paddy fields, homes, status, fame, influence, power, all of these things belong to nature. They're all just natural things. But when we foolishly take them to be I and mine, we are plundering nature. And from this plundering of nature due to the power of ignorance and attachment, all the difficulties and problems and hassles that exist in the world arise. Because from this, this attachment, from this I and mind, there arises all the forms of selfishness, which is what causes all the problems and conflicts and wars in this world. When we no longer are attaching in this way, when we give it all back to nature, then there is no more of this selfishness and all these, these problems disappear. Because we, because we are crooked, we steal all these things from nature. And in, in possessing, in thievishly possessing everything, there is I in mind, there is ego. And out of ego arises selfishness. And selfishness is the source of all the problems in our lives and in our world, all the, all the difficulties, all the crises, all the destruction comes from this, this selfishness. When we can stop stealing, when we can, when we can give up this crookedness and corruption and stop stealing things, then the, the, this removes the source for all selfishness, and then these problems have no more basis. So we return all the things we have plundered from nature by taking them as I or mine, and giving them all back. In giving them back, selfishness is ends by ending all this thievery, selfishness ends. And when there is no more self, when there is no selfishness, the people are unselfish. The members of parliament are unselfish. The government is unselfish. And when that occurs, where are there going to be any problems? The, the capitalists are unselfish. The workers are unselfish. The employers and employees are un unselfish, so they can talk to each other, they can listen to each other and understand each other. And then there is a peace in the world, there's, there's, a, the worldly, there's a worldly Nibbana when selfishness ends. So one can see that this supremely excellent Dhamma of the Lord Buddha is able not only to, does not only lead to individual liberation or some, to personal experience of Nibbana, but it's also the way to solve all the problems in this world. The Buddha's Dhamma solves all problems, both personal and social, spiritual and worldly. We will summarize the the essence of anapanasati as follows. In the first stage, we will understand the body thoroughly, 
until we can master the body completely. This practice is, is sila, morality, and samadhi, concentration on a supreme level. In the second stage or area, we understand and master the feelings, the vetana. This practice is both, is a supreme form of both sila and samadhi. In the third area or stage, we know and understand the mind in all its aspects, in all its meanings. This is samadhi and sila inclusively. These three areas, stages of practice have samadhi and sila um, within it directly, and there is vipassana indirectly. In the fourth stage, we master nature. We master nature by not attaching, or we master, excuse me, we master dhamma. We master dhamma by not attaching to dhamma, by not attaching to any nature or aspect of nature. By mastering nature and dhamma in this way, there is the highest form, the most complete and perfect form of vipassana or insight. And so we can say, although no one believes it, that through this by practicing this way, one can master the entire cosmos. All of the whole cosmos is mastered when one can master these four stages of practice. Next, we will discuss Nibbana, as we have promised to do. Nibbana is the fruit of practicing anapanasati successfully. We study and train in anapanasati um, thoroughly and deeply. Through this study, then, the, the result that occurs is that one receives Nibbana. Excuse me, a moment ago, we study and train, we study dependent origination, then we practice anapanasati, and then we realize Nibbana. These three things are interconnected by understanding dependent origination. We are able to practice mindfulness with breathing and then through practicing mindfulness with breathing successfully, thoroughly, there arises the realization of Nibbana. First of all, we'll consider a, a certain problem. The problem is that nobody wants Nibbana. People don't want Nibbana because they think it means death, and so they shake their heads because they have no interest in, in Nibbana. Or they think that Nibbana is, is out of date, or it's something that we can't practice to, that it's beyond our reach that we're unable to realize Nibbana, so nobody is interested in it. Certain branches of the government despise Nibbana. We won't say which ones, but they despise Nibbana because they believe that it's an obstacle to the material development of the country. They don't talk about Nibbana. They don't know. They don't use Nibbana. They don't have anything to do with Nibbana. But in fact, in reality, it's not like that at all. Think about it. If there wasn't Nibbana, there wouldn't be any Buddhism. Without Nibbana, there's no Buddhism. So what good is, what good is some kind of Buddhism if it ignores Nibbana? There are certain reasons why Nibbana can 
be very beneficial for the world even today, in particular this modern world today. Even if we don't do it totally, completely, it is still possible to get very satisfying results through Nibbana bringing about peace, peace in the world here. So next we'll consider in detail what Nibbana is. We speak generally in a broad sense. We can say Nibbana is the thing that humanity has sought from the very beginning way back to our ancient ancestors who ran around naked in the forests and hills. Nibbana was the thing that they were, they were looking for, searching for. Nobody ever thinks of this, but all along, humanity, even in the more primitive forms, has been seeking Nibbana. Nibbana means cool or coolness. It doesn't mean death. Nibbana means to have a cool heart, a cool mind. This coolness of heart and mind is the meaning of Nibbana. Way back in the early stages of humanity, our ancestors wanted this coolness to just rest and relax and have a cool heart and mind was something they were very interested in. So even way back then, this, this cool heart and cool mind has been the desire, the goal of, of people. They learned how to seek higher and higher levels and forms of Nibbana. This is the meaning of of human evolution, this discovering and knowing how to realize higher and higher forms of Nibbana. In the Pali Brahma Jala Sutta of the Diga Nigaya, it mentions how at one time there was a certain group or a number of people who took sex as they took sex as Nibbana because sex would cool down certain desires and cert a certain heat in the mind. They considered sex to be, be, to be coolness. This is one group's idea of Nibbana. Another group of people realized that that was too much trouble, it was too much of a hassle because there was still a kind of heat and anxiety that was being hidden within one's heart. And so they searched and discovered the coolness of when the mind is totally relaxed and at peace, <clears throat> the, the coolness, the peacefulness of, of samadhi, of jhana, when the mind is absorbed into some object, it, is, it can rest and be at peace. And so the sages and recluses, the hermits in the forests and caves, they discovered this higher form of Nibbana, which the various levels of Nibbana which correspond to the different levels of jhana or absorption. This is a higher meaning that another group had for Nibbana. The, the calmness and tranquility of the fourth jhana, this, is, this can be taken as a, long, a form of Nibbana which lasts longer than any of the other jhanas. In the Bhadanaya Vaga or the Bhadanaya chapter of the Sola Banha, the, the 16 questions, in the Kutaka Nikaya, there was some followers of a different sect in India who came to ask a series of questions of the Buddha. And one of them asked the Buddha to explain what his Nibbana was. 
They asked the Buddha what his Nibbana was, the Buddha's Nibbana was. This shows that they themselves had their Nibbana or their version of Nibbana, but they weren't satisfied with it. They had doubts about it. So they wanted to know what the Buddha's Nibbana was like. This demonstrates that there were various kinds of Nibbana or versions of Nibbana in the Buddha's time. This shows that in the Buddha's time in India that every sect or group had its own kind of Nibbana. So the Buddha demonstrated the, the Nibbana of Buddhism and these these religious seekers liked it and so they returned home as as arahants so all the different sects in india had their versions of nibbana and then there's the buddhist nibbana is one particular one should not confuse the buddhist nibbana with the other nibbana in the upanishad teaching teachings of the hindus from a few centuries before the Buddha, they, they, their highest thing, their equivalent to Nibbana was called Paramatman. When their personal Atman or, or self is freed from this world, then it, it unites with the Paramatman. It re, we can't, we can't say where the Paramatman is. But when the individual self is freed from the world, it unites with the Paramatman. This is the highest thing in the Upanishadic teaching. So for them, the important thing was moksha, moksha, liberation from this world, so that the, the Atman can unite with the Paramatman. I don't know if you believe this story, but when I was in India 30-something years ago, I was riding on the train and it came to a stop at a train station. And then right outside our window, there was an old man in raggedy, tattered clothes. Mm -hmm. And so I handed him some money. And he said, no, no, I don't want any money. I only want moksha. I only want liberation. So he wouldn't take the money. At Banaris at the, the bathing place next to the, the Ganges, we met an old, old grandmother who was all just skin and bones. And when we offered her some money, she, she wouldn't take it. She said all she wanted was moksha, liberation, wasn't interested in money and things like that. It's rather embarrassing or even shameful that we Buddhists don't desire Nibbana as much as the Hindus in India desire moksha. In this world of extreme material development, what, what is Nibbana? Those who don't want the Nibbana of Buddhism, what meaning do they give to Nibbana? What is the Nibbana that these consumer people want? Nibbana for them is to be rich and wealthy, to have absolute power in this world. In a materialistic age like this, people, it turns out that people have no interest in Nibbana. They don't like it. Some even hate it because they don't see, they don't see the meaning, the value of Nibbana because they're so wrapped up in these materialistic times. But if we speak about we Buddhists in particular, we can say that we still are able to have the, Bo the Nibbana of Buddhism as is appropriate for our each particular individual. Each particular individual can have a <clears throat> the Buddhist Nibbana as, as fits them. So what is Nibbana? In ancient India, when something hot cooled down, that was called Nibbana. 
in the Pali there's the the word Pachota Sewa Nipanang. Pachota means fire. The cooling of the fire is called Nibbana. So when something hot, when some fire calms down, cools down, this is the ancient meaning of Nibbana. This word was so widespread in India, everybody used it. It was even used in the kitchen. So when the, the child of the home would go out and yell to the rest of the family, come on in and eat. It's the, the soup is Nibbana. The yaku, the, the rice gruel or soup, is Nibbana. It was used even in this very ordinary way. Or when the goldsmith has melted some gold in his oven, when the, the gold becomes liquid and then it's poured into some mold or form, the goldsmith sprinkles water on it to cool it down. In the Pali, this is <coughs> called Nipanaya, Nipanapaya, which means to make it Nibbana, to make it cool, to make it Nibbana. So to cool something down is to make it Nibbana, to sprinkle water on it or whatever so the heat goes away. This is, Nibbana was used even regarding material objects like this. Another level of Nibbana, another example which is no longer material, or is not so material, is that wild animals from the jungle, fierce, dangerous animals, which are captured and then trained until they become tame. They are said to Nibbana, to tame a wild animal so that the, its fierceness, its dangerousness, its harmfulness disappears. This, this is called Nibbana. So Nibbana here doesn't mean to kill the animal. It just means to tame it, to, to cool it down, whether an elephant or whatever. Now this, somewhere along the way, the meaning of to be of thoroughly cool, the meaning of Nibbana, to be thoroughly cool, this meaning was changed or we could say perverted to, to mean to die. Somewhere, someone or somebody changed or twisted the meaning of Nibbana to mean eternal death, to die forever. So this, its original meaning was to be thoroughly cool, cool. And someone turned this into to be dead forever. So now we'll just quote the Buddha to keep it simple. In the words of the Buddha himself, the end of lust, the end of hatred, the end of delusion, this is Nibbana. Lust, hatred, and delusion are fires, fires that are worse than the fire in the kitchen or any external physical kind of fire. So the worst kind of fires are lust, hatred, and delusion. So Nibbana is the highest quenching of the worst kinds of fires, these fires of lust, hatred, and delusion. So the, the true meaning of Nibbana is the ending of kilesa, defilement. The total ending of defilement is the true meaning of Nibbana. But when there is some, a partial ending of, ni of defilement. This is also Nibbana. The coolness that comes from in samadhi, when there is good samadhi, there are no defilements. This is a level of Nibbana. And the deeper the samadhi, these are deeper levels of Nibbana. So any time that there is an ending of defilement, can be on the level of stream entry, of the once returner, the non returner. All of these where the defilements are not yet totally eradicated are still different levels of Nibbana. Now we'll consider a 
pa a passage from the Pali scriptures that's even more clear. It's from the Iti Vutaka of the Kutaka Nikaya. Here, the Buddha spoke of Nibbana Datu. He didn't just say Nibbana, but said Nibbana Datu. Datu means element or a natural essence. And so the Buddha is saying that Nibbana is this, Nibbana Datu is an the natural essence or the element of Nibbana which exists naturally in nature there is this this element of Nibbana so we should be careful not to just carelessly say Nibbana, Nibbana, Nibbana but here the Buddha spoke of the Nibbana Datu the naturally existing element of Nibbana which can be found everywhere Nibbana is this element which exists naturally and exists all over the place, everywhere. There's no place where this Nibbana element doesn't <coughs> exist. So don't talk of going. It's, don't talk about going to Nibbana. The more you try to go, the, the less you'll, you'll get there. You'll, the more you'll be frustrated. It's it's actually ridiculous or crazy to talk of going to Nibbana, but many people do. And so their understanding is totally upside down. Instead of trying to go to Nibbana, just remove the coverings, the things that enwrap and entangle the mind. <clears throat> remove ignorance, and then Nibbana will come all by itself. Nibbana, this element of Nibbana is already there. So just remove the ignorance that prevents the mind from realizing Nibbana. It's like when you open the window, the sunlight comes in. You don't have to go to the sunlight, just open the window. Just remove the ignorance which covers the mind and Nibbana will come in by itself, will enter itself. Mindfulness with breathing is the way to strip off the things that cover the mind. Ignorance and attachment is wrapping up the mind. With anapanasati, we can peel off this ignorance and attachment. This and then the nibbana datu, the nibbana element, can make contact with the mind. In this passage from the Pali, the Buddha says there are two kinds of nibbana or two kinds of Nibbana Datu. There's the, the Nibbana element with Upati remaining, and there's the Nibbana Datu with no Upati remaining. Upati can be translated burden or heaviness. The problem here is the meaning of Upati. This is a rather controversial um, passage and the interpretations of it are, are varied. Although upati can literally mean heaviness or burden, it's interpreted here by many to mean the defilement. Others take upati to mean the body, to mean life. But it can also mean the, the feelings. So, there is, in one kind of Nibbana Datu, there are still feelings arising. There are still positive and negative feelings. And then in another kind of Nibbana Datu, there are no, none of this feeling of positiveness and negativeness. We'll listen to the Pali itself and translate it directly, word by word. Monks, there are two kinds of Nibbana Datu. How are those two kinds? The two kinds are Sa Upadisesa Nibbana Datu and Anupadisesa Nibbana Datu. How is this Sa Upadisesa Nibbana Datu? What is it like? A monk is Arahant with the Asavas, the eruptions, ended has finished following the brahmacharya, 
the things to be done have been completed, has put down all burdens, the benefits which one should desire have been received, the fetters to existence have been fettered, severed, has been liberated through right wisdom. These eight phrases are the meaning of this kind of arahant. Here's the important part which you should listen to very carefully and should even hear the Pali words themselves. Which means the five indriya, the five faculties, which here means the five senses of that monk still exist. Because they have not yet been eliminated. They still experience pleasure or satisfaction and dissatisfaction. They still feel things as being sukha and dukkha. The end, the ending of lust, the ending of hatred, or the ending of delusion of that monk. This, this is saupadisesa nibbana dasu. So the essence here is, this is the arahant where the asavas have been ended, the asavas or eruptions have been ended, but the faculties have not yet been eliminated. Feelings that certain things are pleasing and others are displeasing, that some things are satisfying and others dissatisfying, this still remains. But the end of lust, hatred and delusion of that bhikkhu is called Sa upadi sesa nibbana datu, the nibbana datu with upati remaining. So this is the matter of sa upadi sesa nibbana datu. The next he talked of, he asked, anupadi sesa nibbana datu, the nibbana datu with without any upati remaining. What is that like? A monk in this Dhamma Vinaya is Arahant, having ended the asavas, has finished the practice of the sublime life, the Brahmacharya, has finished all duties, has put down all burdens, has received the benefits to be received, the fetters which keep one stuck in existence have been severed, he has been freed or liberated through right wisdom. So now we come, the first, so far it's the two, the two sections are exactly the same. Now we come to the part that is different. In, within this, within this life or individuality of that monk, within this life, all Vedana, all feelings have become totally cool. Hmm. This we call Anupadisesa Nibbana Datu, the Nibbana Datu without any Upati remaining. The meaning here is that all the feelings are thoroughly cooled. Any feeling which appears has no meaning of being satisfying or dissatisfying, of being sukha or dukkha, happy or painful. The feelings are thoroughly cooled. There's, no, there's nothing hot about them. These, any feelings that appear or occur don't have any heat or heaviness. For the mind. This is the meaning here that the feelings are thoroughly cool. The meaning is the same as far as being an arahant. 
but in one case the the feelings are not yet cooled and in the other the feelings are absolutely are thoroughly cooled and mm -hmm. the the poly is very clear that it's thoroughly cooled in this life thoroughly cooled in this life not after dying but right now in this life while still alive another way of putting it is raka tosa moha are ended identically in both cases but here the feelings are not yet cooled whereas here the feelings are thoroughly cooled to understand this easily we'll compare it with an ordinary person the ordinary person the the commoner when experiencing something there arises feeling and then the feeling is will either be pleasant or unpleasant will be attractive or unattractive to the ordinary person and then the person attaches to this attractiveness or unattractiveness the pleasantness or unpleasantness and through this attachment it all becomes heavy so when the ordinary person eats food they experience it as delicious or not delicious as distasteful and then various attachments and defilements arise but with the first kind of arahant this arahant where the asavas have been ended eats food and it still tastes either delicious or or not very tasty but this has no power over the the arahant there's no defilements no attachment arises and so eating food even though it tastes delicious or not does not create dukkha for this first kind of arahant but we ordinary people every time we eat food whether it's delicious or not we fall into liking and disliking we like this we don't like that depending on whether it tastes good or tastes bad then the second kind of nibbana dhatu the second sort of arahant when eating food it doesn't feel delicious or not delicious this arahant doesn't distinguish it as delicious or not delicious tasting good or tasting foul he just eats it just you just eat it and eat it and eat it and there's no deliciousness or anything like that there's no distinctions or discrimination the first kind of arahant still feels positive or negative towards the objects that make contact which which the mind experiences the second kind of arahant doesn't feel any positive or negative regarding the objects of experience but don't forget that this first arahant although feeling positive and negative towards things no defilements arise there's no attachment and no defilement and both of these arahants have not died they're both completely alive so why don't we try and and do what do like the arahant or follow after the arahant so when eating food whether it tastes good or bad just experience it as delicious or not without letting any defilements arise don't let any liking or disliking occur just eat it and experience it without any liking and disliking because once we like it and dislike it once these defilements arise this is the source of ripping others off of stealing of corruption and all these other things to get these things we like that we find delicious just delicious or not tastes good or it doesn't that's all just leave it be let it let it go at that without liking it or disliking it without turning it into attachment and defilement to eat like this to just eat <coughs> in this way this is <clears throat> the best way to follow the footsteps of the arahant this world that we live in is full of of all kinds of positive and negative objects it's just chock full of of different objects with, <clears throat> which make contact with the mind the mind we experience sights which are beautiful and ugly or sounds which are are 
harmonious or discordant. There are odors which are um, sweet-smelling or foul-smelling, tastes which are delicious and not very delicious, touches which are, are soft and those which are coarse, and then mental experiences which are pleasing and displeasing. This is the world we live in. It's full of these, these objects which are desirable and undesirable. But in experiencing these things, oh, you know, while knowing that this one is desirable and this one is not desirable, don't, don't desire them and don't not desire them. Don't, don't get into, this one's likable, but don't like it. This one is, is hateful, but don't, but don't hate it. Just, you can say, I ain't going to like you, I ain't going to hate you, I ain't going to like you, I ain't going to hate you, which, whichever kind it is. If we practice in this way, then none of these objects will create any problems for us. So what if it's pleasant or nice or beautiful? Don't, don't let it trick you into liking it. So what if it's ugly or tastes rotten or smells bad? Don't let it trap you in disliking it and hating it. I don't want to, I ain't going to like you, I ain't going to hate you. Practice in this way. A very easy way of practicing is practicing with food, because we eat food every day, so it's totally very easy practice to do. When we eat food, when it comes onto the tongue and it tastes good, then stop right there and, and I ain't going to be delicious with you. I ain't going to like you. I ain't going to let you make me feel delicious. I ain't going to start wanting more. Just stop it right there. <clears throat> if it feels delicious, it tastes good, just stop it right there and don't get caught up in it. A secret to, to observe, to discover, is that the, the deliciousness causes the sense of the one who is delicious or the one who experiences deliciousness. And that when the feeling something is not delicious leads to the, <clears throat> the sense that there is one who is not experiencing deliciousness. Or we could say that when there is pleasure, this one leads to the pleased one. And when there is displeasure, this leads to the displeased one. <clears throat> So if we, we have to learn, we should learn to stop it. Just if there's pleasure or displeasure, stop it right there. And don't let it turn into some, the ego that is pleased or displeased. Because once there's this pleased and displeased ego, it spins off into all the different kinds of selfishness. So even if pleasure and displeasure arises, deliciousness or non-deliciousness, Stop it right there and don't let it go any further. Or to put it in more scientific terms, positive feeling leads to a positive ego. Negative feeling leads to a negative ego. But whether it's a positive ego or a negative ego, it's no good. It's not going to do us any good. It's just a, a big hassle in trouble. So even if there's a positive feeling or negative feeling, don't let it stir up positive and negative egos. We don't need these, these kinds of egos because whether it's positive or negative, these egos lead to selfishness and then this selfishness destroys the world. So don't have anything to do with these positive and negative egos. Let go of the positiveness and negativeness. So don't let positive and negative feelings arise. Instead, be, be motionless, be still in correctness. Be, be still, be unmovable in that state of correctness where there is no positive or negative. This is called a tamayata. Don't get caught up in positive and negative feelings. Just remain in this stillness, this unshakableness, that be unshakable in correctness. We want to repeat this over and over again, maybe for a thousand times, because we're afraid you might forget. 
So to summarize this discussion of Nibbana, the Nibbana Dhatus, there are two kinds. There's the Nibbana Dhatu, where the Vedana are not yet ther- thoroughly cooled. And then there is the Nibbana Dhatu, where the Vedana, the feelings, are thoroughly, completely cooled. So there are these two kinds of Nibbana Dhatus. And please, please understand that this has nothing to do with being dead. The Vedan, it's cool, but this is, it's a cool life. It's not a cold death. This Nibbana or Pra-Nibbana, we should, in Thai it's nice, we can use Pra. We should put Pra in front to show respect because Nibbana is the highest, most excellent thing there is. So Pra Nibbana is the the highest thing. Nibbanang Paramang Sukang. Nibbanang Paramanti Putta. All Buddhas say that Nibbana is the highest thing. Oh, this is the most excellent and highest thing. By studying Paticca Samupada thoroughly and deeply, and then practicing anapanasati steadily and correctly. Nibbana, this highest, most excellent thing, will be the result of our study in practice. So the matter of Nibbana has been discussed. There remains just the problem of of language, of words. There's, if we want to talk about death, especially the death of the Arahant, we should never use the word Nibbana. But if if we look through the Pali Suttas, we won't find one place where the word Nibbana is used for the death of an Arahant. But in some places, the word Parinibbana, Parinibbana is used for the death of an Arahant. For example, in the Parinibbana Sutta, the Buddha says, in three months, I will parinibbana. So this is referring to the death of the arahant, the death of one who is awakened and totally free of defilement. So if you want to speak of death, please use the word parinibbana and not the word nibbana. But it can still be a bit confused because this parinibbana, which refers, which By the way, pari can mean all around, so it's like to be cool all around. This can be used to mean the death of the arahant is not just mentally cool, but physically cool or cold. Um, This, though, is often used in the sense of the word nibbana. So there are many places where the Buddha talks about pari nibbana here and now, where obviously one is still alive. So this word parinibbana can still be a bit ambiguous. For example, there's one place where the Buddha says, Pariniputo so kakawa, parinibbana ya tamang te seti. It wasn't the Buddha, but someone else said that the the pakawa, the exalted one, has parinibbana in order to teach the way to parinibbana. So obviously someone who's um, dead isn't able to teach the way to parinibbana. So to have parinibbana in this sense doesn't mean to die. So these words nibbana and parinibbana are always can always be a bit ambiguous, and so sometimes they're used to refer to death, and sometimes to to refer to when the arahant is still alive. But regardless of this that there is some ambiguity in the way these words are used in the Pali. The the proper meaning, the essential meaning of Nibbana is as we have discussed. When the defilements have been removed, then life is cool, life is thoroughly cool. This is the Arahant, the one who is free of defilement. So we should remove the defilements and then Nibbana will come by itself. Try to the fullest extent 
to the best of your ability to study dependent origination and try to the fullest extent of your ability to practice anapanasati. And then pranibbana will manifest for us, to us. Thank you again for being good listeners. We ask your forgiveness if we have caused you to experience aches and pains or any discomfort. Mm-hmm.